सहना सहनौ भुनक्त सह बीर्ज करवाहे तेजस्वीनावधी तमस्तु मावित विशावहे ओम शांति 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 दिस लोका हैज टेकन मी बैक टू माय मेमोरी लेन आई स्टिल रिमेम्बर आई वाज थिंकिंग हाउ डू आई बिगिन from my class 4 till class 10 from 1976 to 83 this chanting was every days before the class begins we did teachers and students together in ramakrishna mission purulia where i studied and thank you vivekananda kendra for helping me to take to the memory lane and for you i am and after 1983 where i used to chant together in group this is the second time that i am doing so it's a long gap and i am really really i mean grateful to dipankar ji for inviting me here but also one thing the reason for my chanting this shloka you know it much better that i am not here as a learned scholar i can see vegi ji aiga brajamani so many scholars elderly intellectuals so it is not like a one way traffic i hope i am audible it's not echoing right it is more of a learning experience i am only sharing a bit of what i know to the enormous knowledge that you have and this is just a beginning to learn from you also it is not a one way it is a to and fro process that is my submission to you madam nandita garlosa chief guest of today's function i am really grateful to you and also uh, excited to see that normally ministers come and give a speech and go back and that also prepared one by the secretary they don't listen to others but here at least we have a minister who is ready to listen to me thank you so much and dr joram begi ji then chakma ji aiga brajamani and director of vkic i do not know it's one of you personally but to all of you so many of you i know some by face and also some of my elders there it's really really privileged for me to be part of this function uh i put up this topic and you might say why this very western sounding terminologies like phenomenological studies of the indigenous faith those who are very much oriented towards what you call make in india naturally this is not make in india but you know swami vivekananda said that it is amalgamation of whatever is the best either from this place or from outside you take the best and reformulate restart that is what you say scientific temper and the cultural traditions of india to go together and perhaps that is what swami ji's vision was of a modern india that he had of course i have my own limitations and disagreement in spite of being a student of ramakrishna mission being a student of philosophy is not to follow whatever the master says but also to question and i think swami ji did this with thakur and that is the beauty of a teacher and taught relationship um why i brought this up today i am not going to give you a uh, big narratives informations laden stories about different indigenous faith there are many people much more equipped than me but my expertise and perhaps i am requesting you to come along with me is that when we try to understand the traditions when we try to understand a religious belief or a culture it is not about x culture ex communities this 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 practices lots of books are being written on that 
those are important. But you perhaps will agree with me that there is a need for a perspective. There is need for a discourse to understand those narratives. Otherwise, we remain lost in informations because there is no dearth of informations. But how you utilize those information, put them into perspective, set a discourse, perhaps that is what is needed in order to understand the indigenous faith and traditions of Northeast India. And as a student of philosophy, that's precisely I'm trying to do. You know, those in the universities and uh, colleges or any institutions of academia, there is always an urge to be more scientific, more objective towards understanding the world around us. If you are not objective, you are not scientific, then you don't talk about any traditions. This is one way of looking. But let us also accept religious practices does not need a scientific explanation. And that is where you bring a wrong method to understand a different content. So there is need for understanding right perspective, right theoretical discourse to understand the kind of content that you are going to study. And that is why I will give the example when the Hemen drop comes to the northeast and rise the naked Nagas, right? And I am forgetting another uh, 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 ethnographer who says all Khasis are promiscuous. All are idol worshippers. Entire Indian traditions is savagery because they worship spirit in every objects around. So how can you find spirit in the inanimate? So these are barbaric. They have no scientific explanation of their own life world. So they are pagan culture. Pagan, right? Animist. And that was a name given not only to this part of India, but the entire Indian religious traditions, cultural traditions were seen as paganic. And I am happy to be a pagan. Paganism has a beautiful side into it. Only when you have a wrong methodology applied to understand that content, you call it by derogatory connotations. But if you look at it from the right perspective, perhaps there is a lot more to learn. And that is why, even from the West, when I borrow this, what Swamiji has also that borrow the scientific temper. When I borrow this phenomenological method, these are a methodology of the minorities in the West. When phenomenology school came up, many philosophical scientific communities says these are mystical methodologies based on intuition. There is nothing much into this. But the point that I want to submit is that Whatever we talk about the objects around us, whether it is a glass or you look at me or a microphone that you see around, these are all objects we all perceive. But perception is not all that is important. There is a need for experience in that. So there is something between what you normally perceive and what is been seen through jo hindi mein kaha jata hai sanskrit mein darshana darshan sirf pratyaksh nahi hai pratyaksh hota hai jo perception aapke samne jo dikhta hai lekin jo pratyaksh ke madhyam se dekhte hain uski andar ja ke ghur ke dekhna samajhna usi ko darshan kehte hain if i am wrong oza is there i will correct me and that is what i am submitting that the idea of experience which are intuitively driven because whatever you see you see this glass but I can never see the way you see it <coughs> seeing is always a subjective experience whatever objectivity you talk about experiencing is the first point of reference to begin then why to deny this experience 
and let us recognize this experiential aspect of the subject, the subject, the agent. And that is why I say phenomenological reading. When Hemendrop goes and sees that Nagas are headhunters, a term he has coined, that Nagas are headhunter barbaric, and many of my Naga friends still now in JNU, when they come up with a seminar paper, writes, we were savages, we were headhunters, Britishers were, have, Christianity has purified us from savagery to civilizations. But I asked you, who were not savages in the entire history of civilizations? What the Greeks did, what the Romans did, what the Mughals did, what the Pathans did, what the India and Pakistan keep on doing and keep giving award on 26th of January in this side and maybe on their side on another date, is it not head hunting? And you killing, you call the Nagas barbary, the way, the way you kill through guillotine, that is a civilized way. So, and unfortunately we imbibe that. And this is something that needs to be really seen through. And that is why I say the methodologically, the experiencing side, unless you be part of the community of which you are studying, you do not feel the experience of that. I am not saying that I can be Adi or I can be Nisi. I have gone through the Adi community and found so beautiful aspect which I am going to narrate. But what I say is jo sympathizing apathy, what you call sympathetic understanding of that community. That is most important and that was lacking in the scholars, ethnographers, Christian missionaries, anthropologists, colonial varia variants who came to this part of India. Never had empathy towards the communities they were seeing. You had a biased idea and you start looking at. So unless your methodology is about recognizing and legitimizing what you call this experiential domain, you cannot have a proper understanding. That is why I tell you one example I was working on. This book is taking a bit too long to complete. When I was going for field work, questioning the idea of beauty in different communities, one of the Adi respondent, who is from, the, uh, uh, I think one of the Californian universities doing PhD there, some Modi, answers that Adis have never idea of beauty. They don't know what beauty is. We were savages, we were barbaric. Only term they say they know is Kampo. But the word Kampo, I was asked, I asked them, Kampo, that is looking good. But what do you mean that when I see this Gamasha, and I don't want to leave it, keep it there, but I, want, I thought I will continue wearing this, it looks good to me. Is, a sense, is it not a sense of beauty that I am appreciating? Just because you don't have a coterminous word for the beauty, these boys and girls educated in Western communities, studying anthropology, made to believe them in themselves as if they were savages. Contrary to, sir, what you said, ki, lack of confidence. And you believe that by learning their methodology, you are confident. You are pseudo-confident. You are not recognizing your own being, your identity, and just saying that it is not there. So that is what I am submitting, that many a times we lack our energies and creativity to understand the meaning of what we are reading. And you, we just blindly follow. Even a method comes, you say JNU, JNU, we are very good in imitating the West, Marxian, liberal, yes, that, but anything indigenously theorizing, that is not happening. And if you do that, then you are seen as you know nothing. That is the unfortunate story. Though I am also borrowing, I am coming to a point 
of the indigenous now. I hope I made sense that methodology has to be seen appropriately whether it can be applied. Like I will give another example before I jump. Please, sorry, I mean, I am told by Dipangarji only 25 minutes. I don't know how many minutes have gone. My classes are for two hours, so please forgive me. I will not take too long. Uh, what did I say this? This methodology is so significant that one girl from Assam was doing in political studies. You will not know the name and I won't also tell. Student is working on Satra of Assam. And I have also been into the Majuli Island and spent time there. And he wants, he wants to read Satrut through the perspective of Marxian and the lib, uh, uh, what is that? I'm forgetting um, Christian sociologist uh, Max Weber. I said, come on, are you going to look for contradiction in Satra? where Sankardev and following leaders were assimilating even the Muslims, tribes, indigenous communities who are not Vaisnavas, even to come to the Namgore. So that practice of assimilation on the Namgore, and you are searching for a contradiction, because Marxism is built on the perennial structural contradictions in dialectical process. There can be no world without a contradiction in historical movement. So is it not a wrong way to look at Entire thesis will collapse, or you are going to search for an exploiter in that. Maybe Shankar Dev might turn out to be an exploiter then. I mean, that is what you are going to look at. And you want to see another Brahmanism in that, whereas Brahmanism is that which the Shankar Dev wanted to eradicate. But if maybe you will again invent a Brahmanism in that fold, because your structure of theorizing is built on contradiction. So I said, why are you doing this? Why don't you take bhakti as a philosophical thought and practice? And I say, if any religious faith have united this country, it is bhakti. Look at across the country, not only in the upper strata of the society, but even a kobler, a mochi, dhobi, that goes with that. And you don't need even tarkasastra to be close, twin, tuned to the bhakti tradition. So why don't you look at bhakti as a method, a philosophical thought? So that is why I said perspective is extremely important. About the indigenous, we today, because of the United Nations charters, then government of India follows, because government of India will follow what United Nations does, because all the IAS officers will do, they will ask the minister to sign it, that is how the practices go. And some seminar will be held where people like me will be asked to speak but nothing will be taken from them. Let me begin with Kesi Bhattacharya, one of the renowned philosophers of his time, Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, whose son Kalidas Bhattacharya was the Vice Chancellor of Vishwa Bharati. And he, for him, the indigenous people are those who are non-modern, non-Western. And it's a very interesting way of looking at. So the modernist articulation of life world, what you experienced in Europe, those communities who are not hindered by that worldviews, whose worldviews grown through the local soil, and that may be Chinese, that may be Arabic, it may be African, it may be Indian. These are indigenous for him. Of course, indigenous is wider. Now, today we only talk of indigenous in terms of scheduled tribe. Because government of India has acknowledged tribe as a category. As a scholar, I think tribe is derogatory term for me. Because it is a colonial construct. You call it indigenous, Janajati, but the tribe has a connotation which comes with the colonial discourse. But unfortunately, government of India has accepted and we all follow it, so it is neutral in one sense. Now the point is, you called only those live world of the STs as indigenous. Then what about the Sotro following people? Are they not indigenous? 
and you will think that indigenous are those tribal people. So I am not indigenous. Let me look at one very interesting practice, perhaps the Assamese may not be knowing, I'm sorry to say this, but this is the Bodo practice of the Batho religion. So when I was going into the Batho, the Bauli Batho, Batho Baurai, his place is there in the middle. In front of that is that what you call the cactus, or, uh, Suzy, what is that? I'm forgetting. Siju. And right side of the Bauri Batho is all Hindu devatas and devis. In the left hand side is all uh, Batho deities in the left hand side of uh, Batho Baurai. In the right hand side of Batho Baurai, Krishna, Mahadeva, Mahadeva is the greatest. Then Ganesha, everyone is given without a symbol. It is an empty space but recognized. I asked how this is, and they also said this is not our God. This is Assamese God. So I said how this has happened. And the story goes is that there is a constant fight between, uh, this is Bodo Kasari as a one group and Ahom on the other. And Ahom being, you know, bigger community and army keeps invading, it's natural. Ahoms are also nothing simpler, they are also like Mughals, they want to invade, control the rest. So they were defending themselves. And the story of the Bodos are, you don't have to believe, but the beauty of that story, because myths are not about truth and falsity. Again, methodologically, if somebody tells you a story, a myth, and you say, this myth is right, this is myth is wrong, then you are doing a wrong exercise. Myths are not to be looked as truth and false, but to be seen the meaning of that myth. What is the meaning associated with the myth? Nobody is going to look at. Of course, I am part of the Krishna consciousness. They believe in the Krishna as a real Godhead and all that. So that is one side. But they say that Ahoms were finding it very difficult to control the Bodo Kasaris. So they caught hold of a dowry, dow, dowry, right? The priest. And says, how, how do you save this Bodo Kasaris from us? You do the pujas for us so that we can win the Bodos and Kasaris. You do puja to please the Bodo gods, Bautho Baurai. And they did. And the priest comes back and says, this is what they have done. So Bodos also start worshipping Mahadeva, Krishna, Saraswati, Ganesha, everybody else. But the, this is a myth. But what is interesting is that the belief in this indigenous communities and Hindus included is not that we do not have one God which is the real God. Everything else is a wrong God, a small God. And that one God who is the right God, every other gods are satans or symbols of pseudo-gods is a Abrahamic viewpoint. It comes from the Judaic tradition. By Judaic, I am saying Christianity, Islam, following from Judaism. So Judaism believes in the one God thesis. Whereas in this, what you call plural society like Hindu, you have 33 crores God. So your whole life will be gone in worshipping. It's one of them if you do it seriously. So you can see that negotiation and acceptance of different viewpoints. And the Bodos are accepting, recognizing the deities of the Ahoms. And Ahoms also recognize to some extent through that story is a mutual acceptance at cultural domain. Though militarily you might be, but maybe who knows, I was thinking maybe I'm totally wrong, I'm not a historian. But you know the matrimonial alliance is a way to bring peace among umpires. Maybe this is a religious worshipping as a way of sustaining harmony between different communities. And these communities in the Northeast were living that in that harmonious ways. Now how do you say who is indigenous and who is not indigenous? 
So for government purposes of getting grants, getting funding for this, you can say I am indigenous, I am not indigenous. But if you look a little more seriously, there is, it's very fluid. It's a gray areas in which it works out. But one point that I want to submit, a major difference which I saw and maybe not necessarily right is that in some of these indigenous communities whom we call indigenous, in spite of a larger worldview they create, it is deeply ethnic. It is ethnically embedded. That is what I see. In the Maitei Sanamahi tradition, for instance, you will, you will not be able to imagine some non maitei to come and become a part of that tradition. Whereas in the Saiva or Vaishnava, it is open. Even there also there are lots of you know, restrictions. When Prabhupada, Swami Prabhupada went and imparted Krishna consciousness outside, people start saying that you are corrupting, polluting the Hindu dharma by taking it to the western world. So there also there are certain orthodox groups. But by and large, in these communities, the ethnic anchoring is fairly strong. But having said that, I will not say that uh, they are completely ethnic oriented. For instance, I'll give you how beautiful is the creation myth in the, uh, what, what you call in Arunachal, uh, Doni Polo myth. And I'm always, I, wherever I go, I talk about Neno Pedo. It's a beautiful narration of a female principle from which all creations germinated. Neno Pedo does not have a face, but it is a spirit, an energy, a feminine energy, because you recognize the femininity through which the motherhood emerges. You might say it might come closer to Prakriti, Purusha Prakriti and that, because it is bound to come. I will not that say that these people have borrowed from this or that. This is a very human tendency that if creation is between the male and female, and it is through the womb of the female that the fetus is created, so your myth that you create is open, imagined feminine spirit. And the beauty of this feminine construction is that all living beings, animals, humans, even plants and trees, comes out from the womb of the nanopedo. And this thesis, this belief that all living beings comes from the womb of the mother spirit, mother goddess, is recognizing what you call a clan sif, even with the trees, even with the forest. Forest is part of your brotherhood, sisterhood. Now you will, the colonial construct will say, these are very savagery thought. But look at today's time when deep ecology crisis, environmental crisis comes. What was the thesis of the Judai? The Abraham's thesis? God, Genesis, God has created this world. God says, let there be light, there is light. God says, let there be earth, there is earth. And it's of the creation it comes. Even the women, God didn't like to create independently. He thought, let him, her be subjugated to men. From the ribs of man, Adam, the Eves was created. See how patriarchal was God. And this is the story. But the universe is created, the nature is created for your consumption. For man. Man has been created with the image of God. God's loveliest creation is Adam. Right? And that is how the creation myth begins. Nature is your, for your use, consumption. Whereas in this, it is not. You are part of the nature. And when I went again, this, in Apatan, uh, this Adi area, the, the ritual was taking place of Ipak, the white piglets and the wines are served to the forest deity. So I asked this lady, who is a traditional healer, why this epoch? And the point is, 
and she is a biotechnologist, I mean, zoologist, I think, as, who has a master's degree in science and practicing the healing, traditional healing also. So you need herbs from the forest and they cut it down and bring. But they recognize the forest does not belong to us. It belongs to a deity. There is a deity like in, in Mahabharata also you have, right? In, in Prasna, uh, what is that? When uh, uh, Yaksha Prasna, before that whole discourse is that they were going for this Vanavrastha and then there is a water, a pond and they were thirsty. They rush into Yudhisthira and says, don't drink. And they all drank and died. The whole point is, it doesn't belong without asking, without asking the owner, you cannot take somebody else's. It doesn't belong to you. The forest does not belong to you. This is what Mahabharata teaches. And here also you find similar belief that deity of the forest controls. I don't control. And it is saying that please this is my offering. I need this for my survival. But I also recognize and I owe it to you. So I am offering this. Please allow us to use your deity. I mean forest. What more beautiful faith than this? A belief that there is spirit in all around. To see that spirit must be the thought about that there is spirit in the world is a derogatory concept. is absolutely wrong. This is what... The colonial masters talk about animism. Animism is a belief which says that there is spirit in all things around. And they said these are barbaric thought. Now animism has been revisited recently by people like uh, uh, Graham Harvey and Bart Davis. And they bring out very interestingly, see how they negotiate animism. Within the western discourse what they are doing, we are not doing it. What they do, they are saying that, well, this spirit is more about a person. It is autonomous. Forest is autonomous. So you are looking for autonomy in the autonomous being of the entity that you are calling as spirit. Why? You don't want to use the word spirit, but you want to use the word person because person is acceptable in academic circle. In your social science theory, if you say person, then they will accept. If you say spirit, they will not. You can see the politics happening. But I am not going into that. But the, we need to emphasize, recognize and not get bogged down by the very idea that there are spirits all around. And that is the beauty of these traditions. I don't know how, many, how much time I have, sir. Already it is, so I think he is smiling, the chairman is so kind because he don't want to, you know, hurt the sentiment of the speaker. But I am extremely sorry for passing, crossing my boundary, but I hope I didn't bore you. Thank you so much, all that. <laughs>